Okay, so uh, this is lecture 20, and in this lecture we're going to talk about uh, CSPs, which means uh, constraint satisfaction problems, and we're going to talk about uh, approximation algorithms for them. So uh, when we were last talking, we were uh, thinking about the max cut problem, which is going to turn out to be a particularly simple kind of constraint satisfaction problem, or CSP. And we spent a lot of time developing a semi-definite program for it, which is a generalization of a linear program. And uh, we got as far as understanding that this would um, let us attempt to solve a max cut problem by uh, finding vectors associated to each vertex that had some properties. And now we're going to talk about how we can try to take these vectors and convert them into an actual cut of good value. So let's recall what was going on. Uh, let's phrase the max cut problem in the following way. So uh, you're given a graph, an undirected graph, G, and you're supposed to partition the vertices into two parts, often called S and S complement. But in this uh, case, we're going to call them uh, all the vertices assigned value 1 and all the vertices assigned value minus 1. So we're going to assign values x, v to the vertices, plus or minus 1. And what we're trying to do is maximize the number of edges that have their endpoints on uh, different sides of the cut. So in other words, we want to maximize the sum over all edges, v, w, just of the indicator that we've assigned different cut sides to the two endpoints, v and w. Okay. Uh, Sorry, I'm getting some, uh, can everybody make sure their mic is muted, please? Uh, thanks. Okay, so, um, right, so last time we developed uh, what was called a semi-definite programming relaxation for this problem. And what was that? Well, here it is up on the screen. Uh, we want to, uh, we're gonna have, in a semi-definite program, we're gonna have variables, n squared variables, one for each pair of vertices, and we call these little y sub vw. And we think of them as being arranged into a matrix. And the idea is that YVW is supposed to stand for the product of uh, XV and XW. Sorry, I'm still getting people who are unmuted. OK, can everybody still hear me? I've tried to mute you all. Uh, OK, so. Um, Right, so YVW is supposed to stand for XV times XW, which is this quantity up here. And so we have a linear objective function involving the variables YVW. And since XV and XW are supposed to both be plus or minus 1, um, XV times XV should always be 1. So we can put this as a linear constraint, YVV equals 1. And also XV is the same as XW, so we can put the constraint that YVW equals YWV. Okay, I just uh, wrote that down here. Because the main constraint we had was that y is a positive semi-definite matrix, which we talked about last time. And um, the point of this is it's a relaxation of this condition that we want. So it's a relaxation of the condition that there exist real numbers, one for each vertex, xw, such that yvw equals uh, xv times xw. Okay, so as we argued last time, you can solve this a uh, semi-definite program and find the optimal y vw's here in polynomial time. Okay, maybe up to some like exponentially small additive accuracy, but we can ignore that. Great. So uh, we also talked last time about what is a positive semi-definite matrix and a uh, uh, square matrix is said to be positive semi-definite assuming it's symmetric matrix. Uh, if, and only if, we have this condition. This is one of the equivalent conditions we talked about last time. If and only if there exists some vectors, little u1 through u, little un, such that the vwth entry of the matrix is equal to the dot product of the vth vector with the wth vector. Okay, so the existence of these vectors, these dot products, all these pairwise dot products give you the matrix y, is uh, equivalent to being PSD. And I've written here, um, that these vectors of which there are n should themselves be in n dimensions. Um, this statement is true. Uh, it's also true if I eliminated this condition that they be in n dimensions. So just if you have vectors in any dimensions, uh, n vectors in any dimensions that have uh, this relationship, their dot products give you the entries of y, then y is PSD. Um, but on the other hand, if such vectors exist, as we argued last time, they can all exist in n dimensions. 
Now, what's uh, interesting here, and in what's uh, you can you can look back at this claim that it's this STP condition is that it's a relaxation of this goal that there should exist numbers x v such that y v w equals x v x w. If we could somehow insist that these vectors be one dimensional vectors, i.e., numbers, then this PSD condition would be exactly equivalent to uh, what we're shooting for. And if we had this uh, exact condition about numbers x v, this would exactly be capturing the max step problem. But alas, we cannot uh, solve that program in polynomial time. But with this relaxation where we allow you know, these x v's, which we're now calling u v vectors, to be vectors in like a large dimension, it almost looks like a more complicated problem. Uh, but interestingly enough, we can actually solve this program uh, in polynomial time. Any questions right now? As always, you can type them into the chat, and I'll catch up with them when I need to. OK. So let me just make a few changes of notation. Instead of um, writing y sub vw down here and uh, insisting that the matrix of y's is positive semi-definite, I'll just use this equivalent constraint about positive semi-definiteness. So this maximization problem uh, is now maximizing over vectors, one vector per vertex in the graph. So given the graph, and this program is now to find uh, vectors, one vector for each vertex in the graph. And what are the constraints we have? Uh, well, the only constraint really we have left was that the um, yvv was supposed to equal 1. So that's saying that uh, the vth vector dotted with itself should be 1. And it's like saying the length of the vth vector squared is 1. And so that's just equivalent to saying that the vth vector is a unit vector. OK, so I'm just changing this notation a bit more. But now we can see this STP relaxation, which we can efficiently solve, is seeking a unit vector for each vertex in the graph. And it's trying to maximize this objective function. The sum over all edges, if you look at the vectors for the endpoints, use of v vector and use of w vector, and you dot them together, and you take a half minus a half of that. Now let's think about this a little bit more as well. Um, so these are unit vectors, so their dot products are going to be between minus 1 and 1. Um, well, actually, I'll come back to that in a second, but let me do this, uh, as it says on the slide, this relaxation check. I want to check that this program is still a relaxation. Um, so first of all, uh, what it means to be a relaxation is that the optimum, the actual max cut in the graph, should have value less than or equal to the semi-definite program's optimum. And I claim that's true because suppose you have any um, cut, some subset of vertices S, which achieves the maximum cut, that achieves this optimum value. Uh, now, what solution can we get for this SDP? Well, I'll just take all the vertices that are in S and assign them like the fundamentally one-dimensional vector that's like plus one uh, in the first coordinate and zeros elsewhere. And all the vectors, sorry, all the vertices that are not in S, I'll assign them for a unit vector, just minus one. OK, so these are definitely unit vectors. They're all lying in a line. And uh, so they're a feasible solutions since they're unit vectors. And you see, if um, you have an edge, vw, where v and w are on the same side of the cuts, then the vectors associated to them will be the same. And so the dot product will be 1. And so this expression, half minus half the dot product, will be 0. So you'll indeed sort of get like 0 points for this edge where the endpoints are the same. But if the endpoints are different, the dot product will, of course, be minus 1. This linear expression will be 1, and you'll get like 1 point, uh, indeed, for um, this edge. OK, and so this uh, says you can always take a feasible like integer solution, like a cut, and turn it into one of these vector solutions that has the same value. But you know, this SDP opt could be bigger because, well, these vectors don't have to be one-dimensional. They can be n-dimensional. So maybe you can make things bigger. And in fact, you can, as we'll see. On the other hand, I mentioned, since all the feasible solutions use unit vectors, this dot product will always be between minus 1 and 1. In particular, it will be at least minus 1. So this linear expression, half minus a half uh, times the dot product, will be at most 1. Oops, this is a typo. It should say the um, optimum is at most m, the number of edges. Okay, and that's because you get. I'll draw in white here. You get uh, at most one for every edge. Okay. 
So let me make now a really kind of uh, slightly gross but useful abusive notation. Uh, before I was calling these vectors, one for each vertex, if the vertex was v, I was calling the vector u sub v vector. Now I'll do something like a little wacky. And for a vector, sorry, for a vertex named v, I'll call its associated vector v with a vector sign. Kind of a weird use of notation, but I, it's actually uh, kind of nice. So now what I'm going to say is we want a unit vector for each vertex. And you know the amount that you get for it is just uh, for the edge with endpoints v and w is just the dot product of the associated unit vectors. And let's think about this dot product a little bit more. Uh, if you remember um, high school algebra, the dot product between two vectors is the product of their lengths times the cosine of the angle they make. Uh, but these are unit vectors, so the product of their lengths is just one. So the dot product is really nothing more than the cosine of the angle between them. And as we've seen before, like you know, if v vector equals w vector, then you get plus one. And, and if v vector is minus uh, w vector, then you get minus one. But for example, if v and w are orthogonal, which they can be once you go to higher dimensions, uh, you know, their angle is 90 degrees, the cosine of 90 degrees is zero. So like if you have two vectors that are orthogonal and they're forming an edge, you kind of get half a point for them. And you get half minus a half times zero. So this geometrically, like these vectors, you have a vector for every vertex, and if like they're you know, antipodal, you get like one point if there's an edge. And if they're the same, you get zero points. If they're orthogonal, you get half a point and uh, everything in between. So this is what the plot of cosine uh, theta looks like as theta goes from zero to pi. OK, so you're trying to embed this graph into like the unit sphere such that the edges are as far apart as possible. Their endpoints are as far apart as possible. So let's do an example, a pretty simple example, but kind of an interesting example. So this example is a five vertex graph. It's just the five cycle graph. And I've called its vertices A, B, C, D, and E. And so in this problem, you're looking to assign a unit vector to like five vertices such that the ones connected by edges are sort of as far apart as possible. Turns out the optimal solution um, for these vectors uh, occurs in three dimensions. And it's actually got a name. It's called Lovas's umbrella uh, because uh, Lotzi Lovas came up with this for a uh, well related sort of problem in coding theory. Um, so yeah, so it's, <laughs> he called it an umbrella. Um, you see, uh, so this uh, peak of the umbrella is the origin in three dimensions. And then like the five, um, what are they called? Some things of the umbrella, spokes, not spokes, there's a word for them. Anyway, these five spokes of the umbrella are the five unit vectors. Okay, so I guess they're all pointing, you know, sort of down. And uh, I haven't actually said which vector is associated to which vertex. And you see, actually, it's not the first thing you might think of. It's not like you just put the vertices like A, B, C, D, E around the spokes of the umbrella. Uh, ribs, I think they're called ribs, the ribs of the umbrella, because you want, um, if it's an edge in the graph, you want these unit vectors to have as big an angle as possible. So in fact, let's say you call this uh, vector here A. Let me get the highlighter out. Oops, not the highlighter, the laser pointer. Let's say you call this first vector A. You may as well do that without loss of generality. Uh, so then you now let's decide where to put B. So you actually, since A, B is an edge, you want to put B as far apart from A as you can. Now. Um, I've, bearing in mind that I've already told you this, the optimal solution happens to look like this, uh, it means that B should be one of these two edges here, sorry, vectors here. So let's say this is B. And then B and C have an edge. So you want uh, C to be sort of as far from B as possible. And you don't mind if C is close to A because they don't have an edge. So perhaps this is C. And then you want D to also be far. And you want E to also be far. And uh, this is it. This is actually the optimal solution. I mean, it's not obvious or anything, but it turns out to be true. And you see that in this solution, um, every edge in the graph ha is associated to two unit vectors whose angle is, well, as far apart as possible in this umbrella. And if you do a little geometry, it turns out to be uh, 4 pi over 5, aka 145 four degrees. <laughs> 
So this is the uh, optimal solution to the semi-definite program for this five cycle graph. And uh, cosine of, I mean, now we, we uh, take a look at what it achieves. Uh, it turns out that cosine of four pi over five is negative phi over two, where phi is the golden ratio, one plus root five over two. And numerically, this is about negative 0.8. Um, so it's pretty good, right? So like every edge in the graph, all five edges in the graph are associated to unit vectors whose dot product is around negative 0.8, which is good. I mean, the smallest it could be, which is what you're shooting for in terms of dot products is negative one and you got negative 0.8. Uh, so a half minus a half times negative 0.8 is positive 0.9. So like this sort of vector solution, it kind of like 90% cut each edge in, in a weird way. Uh, and so for, and therefore, uh, oops, this was me messing around. I don't know why that's on the slide. Ignore this. Uh, right, so what's the integer solution? The actual solution here, the optimal cut uh, is four edges because this is not a bipartite graph, so it's impossible to uh, find a partition that cuts all the edges, but you can get four to five. Uh, is there a question? Okay. Uh, but the STP opt is this like approximately 0.9 times 5 because every edge is achieving this 0.9. So the STP opt is around 4.5. Okay, so this is an example where the STP really is a relaxation in the sense that the STP gets a value that's bigger than the optimum. But it's still kind of non-trivial. And just uh, out of interest sake, the ratio here 4 over 4.5 is around, uh, well, it's like 8 nines. It's around 0.88. Or more accurately, it's exactly this number. Um, right. Okay, so uh, this is an example of a solution to the semi-definite program for max cut on this graph. And uh, now let's talk about uh, this concept of rounding. Um, so again, when we were solving problems before with linear programs, we take an integer program, relax it to a linear program, get some kind of like fractional solution. And then what we tried to do was like convert or round this fractional solution to an integer solution, like a real solution, um, where the, uh, um, the, the value of that solution was as close to the LP value as possible. Okay, and we're gonna try to do that again here. Except instead of like a fractional solution, we have a vector solution. But we're again going to try to round these vectors down from n-dimensional vectors to like one-dimensional numbers, plus or minus one, and this will give us a cut. Okay, so there's a very beautiful, uh, natural, and uh, elegant way to do this, uh, given by Gomans and Williamson in this famous paper from 1994, and. It's this, you have all these vectors in space that you've gotten out of solving your STP. And you wanna partition them into two parts. So what you can do is pick a hyperplane through the origin. And since you know we don't really know much else to do, or like maybe the easiest thing to do is just pick a random hyperplane through the origin. One that's like rotationally symmetric. So just a random hyperplane through the origin. And yeah, that splits your vectors into two uh, parts, and therefore it splits your vertices into two parts, and just let's call those our parts, S and S bar. So this is a cut, and now we have to analyze this, or we would like to analyze this and understand, um, in expectation at least, uh, what number of edges can we expect this to cut. And just as a little callback to, I don't know, lecture three or something, Algorithmically, how do you actually pick a random hyperplane through the origin? Well, hyperplane, you can associate a hyperplane with its normal vector. And you can get a random normal vector just by picking all the n components to be Gaussian. So remember this most important fact about Gaussians is if you pick n of them independently, the resulting vector is like rotationally symmetric. So algorithmically, the way you actually execute this, this line of the code is to uh, just pick n Gaussians and consider the hyperplane orthogonal to them. Uh, in particular, actually, you put every vertex into S if its vector, V vector, makes a positive inner product with G vector and a negative, if you put it into S bar, if it makes a negative dot product with G vector. 
Okay, so let's talk about the analysis. And what do we really want to do with this analysis? So we haven't given some vectors. There's two things going on. First of all, these vectors achieve some value for the objective value for the semi-definite program. Namely, they achieve the sum over all edges of this expression, half minus a half times the cosine of the angle between the endpoints. And we have this algorithm now that produces a cut, and we are interested in like how many edges it cuts. And we want to um, bound that in terms of this SDP expression, objective expression. So this is what we care about, the expected number of edges cut by this random hyperplane rounding algorithm. Okay, so we can write this as the expectation over the random hyperplane of the sum over all edges VW just of the zero one indicator random variable that S cuts the edge VW. That one of V is in S, one of V and W is in S and the other is not in S. Okay, so as always in life, whenever we see this expression, you should switch the expectation and the summation, and then you'll have expectation of an indicator, and you, the expectation of an indicator is a probability, so you'll get to this expression. So it's the sum over all edges of the probability, again, over the uh, choice of the random hyperplane through the origin, that, well, S cuts this edge according to the algorithm, if and only if the two vectors, V vector and W vector, associated to these vertices by the SDP, are on opposite sides of the hyperplane. Okay, and what's nice is we can now analyze this on an edge by edge basis. So we can like fix a uh, an edge VW in our minds and the associated unit vectors V vector and W vector and ask like what's the probability that a random hyperplane will split these two vectors. So here's a two dimensional picture. Of course, it's really an N, in N dimensions, but uh, Actually, in another sense, it's really in two dimensions, as you'll see. So uh, here's the unit sphere, and we have two vectors, v vector and w vector. And we're picking a random uh, hyperplane through the origin. And in fact, really, it only, uh, it really is two dimensional in the sense that, like, if you think about this geometrically for a minute, whether or not a hyperplane you know, splits these two vectors, I don't know if these, my hand gestures are going to make a difference, it really only depends on. Uh, what, like where the normal vector to the hyperplane is when projected onto the two-dimensional plane spanned by B and W. I didn't say that super well, but um, the upshot is, uh, I mean, picking a random hyperplane, uh, once you fix V and W in your mind, picking a random hyperplane, you can really do it analogously just by picking a random, well, uh, hyperplane or line in the two-dimensional plane where V and W live. And uh, like this, you know, orange uh, line that I've just spun here. And uh, once you have this geometric realization, you know, it turns out there's a very simple expression for this probability. You see, uh, there's basically like 180 degrees of possibility for how this orange thing uh, rotates. And uh, the event, that they get split, you know, occupies an angle of the angle between V and W. So what I'm saying here is this probability, once you fix V and W, the probability that they're split by a random hyperplane through the origin is precisely their angle divided by pi or 180 degrees. You know, uh, once you get down to this two dimensional case, I think that should make sense, right? Like if V and W were at angle zero, then the probability that this hyperplane would split them is zero. And if V and W were at angle 90 degrees, let's see if I can draw it here. If V and W were at angle uh, 90 degrees, like V was this, okay, then, you know, the probability that the orange uh, line would split it would be like sort of, you know, only if the orange thing was going like this, it's a 50% chance. And again, if V is like this, if V is actually opposite to W, then there's a 100% chance that they'll get split by a random diameter of the circle like this. Does that make sense? Any questions? Good. So this is kind of cool because we have like um, an edge by edge expression for both things, an edge by edge expression for the SDP objective value, that's this, and an edge by edge expression for like the expected contribution uh, to the total cut value. 
know, the probability that the edge gets cut by the algorithm. And so, and they're both in terms of just the angle between, I mean, this is also key, just involve the angle between the two vectors. So now it's just like some numeric comparison between this uh, magenta thing and this green thing. So let me put this back up here. Expect the number of edges cut by the algorithm is the sum of this purple or magenta expression. And you can just plot these two quantities as a function of the angle uh, theta. So, you know, any two vectors, unit vectors, their angle is somewhere between zero and pi, zero and 180 degrees. And, uh, you know, the, frac the probability that these vectors get cut by the algorithm is like a linear function of their angle. If they're at angle zero, it's zero. If they're at angle pi, it's one. So it's just uh, this, this expression up here, theta over pi. Um, but the STP, the contribution of the semi-definite programs value is this nonlinear thing. It's half minus a half cosine. So it looks like this curve. The point is that these two expressions are not the same, but they're pretty close. They're not too different. In particular, if you look at the ratio between these two expressions, um, you know, you're, you're worried this STP opt could be bigger than the actual thing you found, but it can never be like that much bigger. This green line is never that much higher than uh, the magenta line. And in particular, the worst ratio between them occurs at this point that's really, really close to 3 quarters pi. It's a teeny bit less. It's here. And even here, the magenta point is like 0.878 times the, the green point. Another way to say it is if you multiply this green curve by 0.878, which I've done in a charmingly homemade fashion here, freehand, um, you get this slightly darker, slightly thinner green curve, 0.878 times the expression with the cosine. And this, dot, this uh, new curve fits underneath the magenta line. Which means that the magenta expression is always greater than or equal to 0.878 times the green expression. Okay, what I'm using here is the fact that this magenta line is above this like this lower green thing, 0.878 times the green expression. Okay, and so now you can bring the 0.878 outside the sum, and you'll get just exactly the STP objective function. So you conclude that the expected number of edges cut by this algorithm is at least you know 87 or 88 percent of whatever the STP optimum is. And you know the STP optimum is always bigger than or equal to the true optimum. That's because the STP, opt uh, the STP is a relaxation of the max cut problem. So this in turn is bigger than uh, 0.878 times the optimum, the optimal max cut. OK, and this is like the end of the analysis of the Gomans-Williamson STP rounding algorithm. And it says, or one way to uh, succinctly say what's going on here is this Coman's Williamson algorithm, this GW algorithm, is a so-called 0.878 ratio approximation algorithm for max cut. So at least in expectation, it's, it will give you a cut whose value is at least 87.8% uh, times the maximum cut. OK, and you can run this many times and take the best cut, and you'll get this to hold not just an expectation with high probability. You can even uh, de-randomize this using Nissan small set generator, a small space generator, and some other ideas, if you like. OK, any questions about that? OK, there's a question. It says, is there any particular reason why we consider r to the n instead of some other dimension in the relaxation? Say r to the log n. It's still a relaxation. Great question. Uh, so remember, yeah, in the relaxation, the STP relaxation, it eventually turns out to be, you know, find a unit vector for each vertex. Uh, to maximize this expression. And uh, so to answer the question, it's sort of not up to us what dimension the solution ends up being in. Um, if we could specify, not only do I want this, but I want these vectors to be in dimension D, then we'd actually be solving an NP hard problem because we could say, oh, I want them to be in dimension one, i.e. that I want them to just actually be scalars. In that case, as we saw, um, the, I mean, the vectors, since you have that their dot products is one, they have to be unit vectors. They would have to just be the numbers, plus or minus one. And then you would exactly get that the SDP uh, captures the max cut problem, which is NP hard. So in some sense, it's like not really up to us. We uh, have to allow them to be sort of any dimension. 
it's weird because by like saying like, you know, I give up, you know, if they can mean any dimension, it actually makes the it polynomial time feasible to like find the optimal vector solution. And as a side note, it's not like they're going to be in like exponentially many dimensions if you, um, you know, uh, uh, think about um, the nature of positive semi-definite matrices for a moment, as we did last time. Um, if, uh, if some dot products can be realized, if you have n uh, vectors realizing some pairwise dot products in any dimension, then they can be realized in n dimensions. As we saw last time, if you, um, you know, do this Cholesky decomposition on the Y matrix you get out of the semi-definite program, uh, you get back n-dimensional vectors. Um, good. On the other hand, uh, related to the question about whether they could be in lower dimensions, it's also true that if you solve the semi-definite program and unfortunately get vectors in n-dimensions, um, you can ran, it's like a known fact, this Johnson Linden Strauss uh, lemma, if you've ever heard of it, that you can randomly project these vectors down to around log n dimensions. And uh, the dot products will, with high probability, not change by very much. So actually, you can get them down to like log n dimensions. But um, in some sense, it doesn't help that much. OK, great. Uh, 